Now, endothelial dysfunction simply means the endothelial lining is not working correctly. So when that happens, it sets off this cascade of the events that I've shown to you. The key is we are not picking up endothelial dysfunction early enough with our testing. We wait until they have a clinical problem, heart attack, stroke, heart failure. Endothelial dysfunction precedes clinical vascular disease by decades. ED starts in the teenager years. In fact, it probably starts earlier. I'm going to show you how you can test this now and start treating patients and prevent the vascular problems before they get their first event. So there's your biochemical and biomechanical mediators. And what happens is these, these multiple infant and insults are attacking the endothelial cells. And the cells themselves become dysfunctional. But also as they become dysfunctional, they lose their glue and they open up. So you see right here what are called gap junctions. That's what prevents things from slipping through. So now you've opened up the gap, gap junctions and you've got an increase in permeability. Things that should not be leaking through are now just pouring into the subendothelial layer. So atherosclerosis becomes a subendothelial disease because all the stuff in the blood which should be there is now sneaking in to the subendothelial lining and that's what sets off the first foam cell, and then a fatty streak and a thrombotic event with a plaque formation. So we've got to keep the endothelium healthy. We've got to keep the gap junctions closed. And the way you do that is, again, by balancing a lot of things, but particularly NO and NGT. As I said, there's huge numbers of mediators. You can put in you know, thousands of things up here. You can pick whatever you like to insult your arteries. But the response is response is basically inflammation, oxidative stress, and autoimmune disease. So here's the way this works. You start out with uh, endothelial dysfunction, and the first marker is the functional problem. And that is in the small arteries, and it leads to a what's called decreased compliance, which is stiffness in the very tiny arteries in the periphery. And so one of the early responses is an increase in blood pressure. Again, it's a marker for small vessel dysfunction. <clears throat> Later, it goes into a structural problem, which leads to an increase in large arterial stiffness, and that is what increases your pulse pressure and results in atherosclerosis. And eventually, the artery says, you know, you're bombarding me with so much stuff, I'm going to try to defend myself. And it starts to try to remodel itself to protect itself. So what does it do? <clears throat> it becomes very thick. The lumen becomes very small, the muscle very thick, and then it just creates more problems. In other words, <clears throat> the body's IQ is incredible. It knows what to do to protect the insults. But over time, the protective mechanism becomes a dysregulated disease. That's a key point to understand. And unless you begin to track this back to the beginning and try to reverse the very beginning of this problem, it's very difficult to track it back once they've got a clinical problem. You've got to attack this. So <clears throat> we've talked about the injury side. Let's talk about the repair side. One of the major repair systems in endothelium is endothelial progenitor cells, or EPCs. These are cells that improve endothelial function and repair the lining. They come from your bone marrow. There's various stimuli that will migrate EPCs to the endothelium, and then they start their repair job. And if you look down here, you can see there's a lot of things that are listed sort of at the bottom. But the idea is try to understand what you can do as a clinician to increase repair systems. So for example, we know that exercise, increasing nitric oxide, <clears throat> estrogen, resveratrol, red wine, um, Certain, uh, anti, certain antihypertensives like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and even statins help to mobilize EPCs. So if you do the same thing, which is repair the system but also decrease the insults, then you start to get improvement in vascular function. Another problem is when you measure someone's blood pressure in your office, what you're measuring does not correlate very well with what's going on in the artery. In other words, you can have a normal blood pressure but already have significant vascular remodeling and vascular disease that doesn't show up. But if you do more sophisticated testing, you can pick up this as an earlier problem and recognize you need to start treatment 
before it progresses to the next stage. And this is the vascular remodeling problem. This is what a normal artery would look like here. You notice that the, this is the vascular smooth muscle and this is the lumen, nice and big. But as it remodels, the artery becomes very thickened and the lumen becomes very small. Now when that happens, it sets up the arterial response to an increased response to norepinephrine, cortisol, uh, other stressors, and other events that make it respond in an exacerbated fashion. So a little bit of cortisol and a little bit of norepinephrine will jack your blood pressure up to levels that it can be malignant. So early on, you have functional problems, which is microvascular impairment that precedes remodeling, precedes structural problems, and precedes hypertension. So for example, if you took a child at say 15 years of age and both of his parents had hypertension, before the child becomes hypertensive, if you look at their endothelial function, do a 2D echo and look at their diastolic function, you will pick up vascular abnormalities present before blood pressure goes up. So here's the thought. Hypertension, again, is not a disease. It's a marker of a preceding vascular problem that's both genetic and environmental. And then you can see this if you do the appropriate testing. So which occurs first? Is it the vascular problem or the blood pressure, or is it really both? Well, it's, it really feeds in both directions. It's a bi-directional problem. Vascular problems de in, in precede the hypertension, but once you become hypertensive, you increase the vascular problem. So once this thing gets started, it is exactly fire in the hole. Okay? It is an inflammatory response in the vascular system. If you look at traditional medical literature, they will tell you even now that we've reached a limit in our ability to reduce cardiovascular disease in this country with our traditional approaches to the top five risk factors. Now, we're not gonna be covering the top five today. We're gonna be covering only one of the top five. But here's the problem. The way we have defined those top risk factors is not correct. For example, I'm gonna show you the correct way to define hypertension, which is not the correct way we're doing it. <clears throat> and sometime in the future, I'll tell you how to define lipids appropriately, because that's totally messed up too. So here's the things that you want to understand about hypertension. <clears throat> you have oxidative stress in the arteries and the kidneys, inflammation as best manifest by C-reactive protein and other markers, autoimmune dysfunction of the arteries, abnormalities in vascular biology with ED and vascular compliance, and on top of that, genetics, epigenetics, and your environmental genetic interaction. So in looking at the reverse concept now of, I have a patient who's inflamed. Why are they inflamed? Their inflammation is causing their hypertension and their vascular disease. So the best marker right now is C-reactive protein, HSCRP. It's a very good marker, obviously, for inflammation. It has a high correlation with blood pressure. As your CRP goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Your vascular disease goes up. C-reactive protein is both a marker and a risk factor. Now listen to that very carefully. When I measure a C-reactive protein, I know I'm inflamed. But what we haven't really emphasized is the C-reactive protein is a risk factor. It's just like having dyslipidemia or hypertension. CRP induces 25 to 30 different abnormalities in your endothelium that you do not want to have. It's a nasty thing to have. So I don't care why your CRP is up, you better get it down. And when the process of getting it down, go try to find out why it's up. So there's a lot of ways to lower CRP initially, and then later on you try to find out the etiology for it. Now, here's, the, here's one of the things that CRP does related to hypertension. I mentioned that angiotensin II is a proatherogenic hypertension hormone. I showed you the receptor that it attaches to, which is the AT1 receptor. I'm trying to make this easy for you. There's another one called the angiotensin II receptor, AT2. That receptor is a good receptor. It vasodilates. In other words, think of AT2 as like nitric oxide. It does all the good stuff. What does CRP do? It blocks the AT2 receptor. 
it attaches to it, which means you have an overbalance of the AT1 receptor, driving blood pressure, driving inflammation, driving atherogenesis, and you've totally taken out the other system, which is AT2, which is your nitric oxide system. That's one of the reasons that CRP is so nasty, because it blocks that balance and it downregulates it. So ENOS and NO decrease because of CRP. <clears throat> so CRP is the best inflammation marker because it's a composite <clears throat> of all the other inflammatory mediators coming from every site throughout the body. Okay, interleukin-6, interleukin-1b, and TNF-alpha are the three precursors that go to the liver, and the liver cranks out C-reactive protein. So when you measure CRP, you're actually getting a composite of total body inflammation. How many of you have heard of calveoli? <clears throat> it's merely a concept, okay. In, your, in every membrane in your body, you have what are called calveoli, which are lipid raft micro domains. Every, every cell has them. Let's just concentrate on the endothelial lining. So each membrane is a, a lipid bilayer. And at the top of these things, you have these lipid rafts that basically determine the downstream inflammatory response depending on what sticks in to the micro domain. Well, obviously, if it's called a calveolar lipid raft, you know what's sticking in there, which is oxidized LDL cholesterol and small LDL particles and other things that you don't want circulating. But within that calveoli, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an enzyme that is uh, related to nitric oxide. It's very simple. So when you stimulate a lipid raft, the downstream effect is inflammation, oxidative stress, and autoimmune dysfunction. Now, I want you to concentrate on a couple of things, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. <clears throat> Whatever you have in your environment, whether it's your diet, uh, plasma micronutrients or whatever, <clears throat> has the ability to stimulate those micro domains. So now we've put another whole system into effect. You remember I showed you the first slide, toll-like receptors, nod receptors, calveoli. So this is one of the receptors that sets off endothelial dysfunction. Well, here's the nasty little protein that sits there. It's called calveolin-1. This stuff <clears throat> basically is the key regulator of nitric oxide in the endothelial membrane. So when oxidized LDL displaces it, nitric oxide levels drop. Okay, so here's the connection. We've always thought that hypertension and dyslipidemia seem to be co-connected. It turns out that oxidized LDL not only does that by decreasing nitric oxide, but oxidized LDL also stimulates the angiotensin 1 receptor. So the point is oxidized LDL has the same effects as angiotensin 2. If you improve someone's lipids, particular oxidized LDL, their blood pressure will fall through that effect. Well, look at the list of things that you can take back on Monday morning and make sure that every patient is taking some of these to reduce their vascular problems. Because these are not just calveolar related, but they also have other effects. Any plant derived polyphenol, fruits and vegetables, resveratrol, quercetin, red wine, green tea extract, dark chocolate, other flavonoids, and other compounds. All of these can be implemented and they will have a preventative effect along with omega-3 fatty acids.